Let us come and have a wee short reading from the book of Genesis. We were there this morning, and we'll come back to it this evening again. Genesis chapter 9. Chapter 9. It's not a familiar passage that the preachers of the gospel use, but I'm turning to it tonight. Chapter 9, and we'll come in at verse 8. Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives, have just come through the flood and stepped out of the ark, and they're now on the earth again. And God is speaking unto Noah. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, for all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you, Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be any more a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And we'll end there at verse 17, and we look to the Lord to bless the reading of his truth to all our hearts. Just let's bow in prayer for a moment, please. Our Heavenly Father, we bow humbly in thy presence. We thank thee tonight for all that thou art all that thou art to each one of us, for in thee we live and move and have our being. But most of all, we thank thee tonight for thy great love, so fully displayed in the person of thy beloved Son, who loved us and gave himself for us. We thank Thee that having spared not Thine only Son, but delivered Him up for us all, Thou dost also with Him freely give us all things. And so, Lord, we would come before Thee and ask Thee to take this vessel of clay in all its weakness and to make it the channel tonight through which the Holy Spirit speaks to all who have gathered. Grant that those who are saved by thy grace will rejoice in thee tonight. And for any who may be in who know not the Saviour, make this the very night of their salvation, when they look unto Christ and live, when they call upon thee, because we know whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So give help, we pray, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 
I want you to come with me this evening to this chapter 9 that we've been reading in Genesis. You may not be familiar with it, but I hope that this evening as we're helped by the Spirit of God that there will be things new for you from this chapter. Dr. Bullinger, one of the great scholars of a past generation, he was over the Trinitarian Bible Society. He delivered it from dissolving completely and took over. He was a great Greek scholar and a great Hebrew scholar. He had a few very strange ideas which I wouldn't recommend anyone to follow. But he used to say that Genesis is the seed plot of the Bible. And then when you read through the rest of your Bible, you will find the fruit that comes from those seeds. And I think after having studied the Word for so many years, that's very true. Old Charles Haddon Spurgeon used to say, take the modernist to the types, and he looks like a fool. If you ever come in contact with an modernist, just take him to the types and you'll have him, because they know nothing about the types of Scripture. And God in his wisdom and in his mercy has given us in the Scriptures types and figures and shadows and pictures of spiritual truth. And so this evening I want to bring you to this, these verses that we've been thinking about, and we shall call it the Lord's bow in the sky. The Lord's bow in the sky. Or we would normally call it the rainbow. And I'm seeking, as God would help me, to bring before you some spiritual truths from this great figure, this shadow, this type, here in the book of Genesis. It's called a covenant. And by when we come to the covenants, we could get ourselves tied up into a lot of argument and dispute. One thing that I would point out about the covenants is this. The covenants belong unto Israel. That's what Paul said. To whom belongeth the covenants? And of course we can think of different covenants that we read about in the Bible. We have the Edenic covenant that God made with Adam and with Eve. And there's the Adamic covenant. And we've got this one, the Noahic covenant. And we could go on and speak of the Abrahamic covenant. And of course, when you go on, you get the Davidic covenant. And then you get the Messianic covenant, which has to do with the millennial kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to really understand them, you need to remember that they belong to Israel. You see, we have the new covenant, but the new covenant belongs to Israel. It is made with Israel, but the blessings of that covenant are ministered to us believers here now in this dispensation of grace. Well, that's just a wee bit about the covenants so that you might think clearly about them. This is one of God's 
covenants. One of his agreements with Noah and his family. And I want you to picture this man and his wife and three sons and their wives as they come out of the ark and they step onto the earth again. I wonder what their feelings were. You know, they have been preserved, they have been saved. Few, that is, eight souls were saved in those days. And they're coming out and God, in his mercy, has brought an end to the flood. What were their thoughts? Would it happen again? If it happened again, would they get into the ark? Or would they perish? And so God is making a covenant with them, and he's giving them a token. That's what we read about here in verse 13. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. So we want to think of the significance of the bow in the cloud. The Lord's bow or the Lord's rainbow. I don't know whether you ever look at the rainbow and think like this. But if you don't, I hope that you will from this night on think like this. That is the Lord's token to us earth dwellers that he will never again destroy this earth with a flood. A token. Ah, you know God gives us tokens, doesn't he? I think of that token that the Lord gave Israel down in Egypt. You remember that great night of the Passover when the lamb was slain and the blood of that lamb was sprinkled on the two side posts and on the lintel of the door. And the Lord made this promise to him when he talked about judgment coming upon the Egyptians, he said that the blood would be a token to him. And when he saw the blood, he would pass over them. One of the great old brethren scholars, I was talking today to Jennifer and David about Sir Robert Anderson. And he was one of the best Bible scholars that this country ever produced. He was an Irish man. His family fought at the siege of Londonderry. He was an expert on the home rule movement when, when it was formed and was involved with British intelligence advising them on the home rule movement. Brilliant scholar and told he could he could speak 13 languages. He's among the great Bible scholars. And he points out that when you read about, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The word really has the thought of, I will hover over you and will not suffer the destroying angel to come in unto you. That's God's token to Israel on the night of the Passover. And I tell you, that with this is just a picture, just a picture of the work that Christ wrought at Calvary's cross. The blood is the token. And all who have trusted in the cleansing power of the blood of Christ are safe forevermore. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. What a truth. I don't know what sins you've committed. Neither am I interested in knowing. But what I do know, no matter who you are, or what you are, or what you may have been guilty of, 
I do know, because God says it clearly in his word, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. It goes on cleansing. So when I look at the bow in the cloud, I think of its significance. God is saying, there'll no, never be a judgment like the flood on the earth again. I'm not going to do that. And it reminds me of this much, that the soul that comes to the Lord Jesus through failure, fault, and sin, and shame, and trusts in his redeeming blood, Judgment is past forever, forever. Shall not come into condemnation, but pass from death into life, and that life is life eternal. So when I think of the significance of this bow in the cloud, I think of the token. But I'm told in this little passage that we read. In verse 16, the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature. Our God is a God who looks. He looks. He says here, I will look at the bow in the cloud, I look at that token that I have given to mankind, and I'll never destroy the earth again, because that token will always be there. Let me say this much. Our God is a God that sees. You know, the Lord saw the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, I have seen the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. He saw in the days of Noah that every imagination of the thoughts of man was only evil continually. And that's like our days. And like Hagar, when she was in the desert with her son, she said to the Lord when he met with her, Thou, O God, seest me. God sees you tonight. You know, there was an old preacher that I heard in my lifetime. And this is one thing I'd say to you young people. Put your trust in the Lord early in life and get to hear the preachers, because I've heard some of the best that Ulster had. And we had some great preachers. There was an old preacher, Bob Dagnall. I was telling our brother David about Bob Dagnall had been booked to take a meeting in Cookstown one time. And when he got home and checked his diary, he discovered he had double booked. So he wanted to write to the man in Cookstown who had booked him, but he didn't know his name and he didn't know his address. So he sat down and he wrote the letter and explained he couldn't take the meeting and then addressed it to Save by Grace, Cookstown. And the man got the letter, Albert Diney. His testimony was good in the time he got the letter. But old Dagnall, I heard him preach one time, and he talked to a young woman who had no time for spiritual things. And he put it to her like this, God sees you. Would you like me to throw on the screen tonight every sin that you've ever committed and let your parents see them? And she said, no, I would not. And if I can remember that night, she put her trust in the Savior. I tell you, you might bluff your parents, and you might bluff a whole lot of people, but God sees. 
He looks and he sees us through and through. Ah, Nathaniel came to the Lord, and the Lord said, Behold, an Israelite in whom there's no guile. And Nathaniel says, Whence knowest thou me, Lord? He says, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. The Lord sees you tonight. Is he looking at the token in this figure? of his redeeming love? Is he looking looking at the token that speaks the precious blood of Christ? Or does he see you in all your sins? Then I say to you tonight, flee to Christ for refuge and salvation and cleansing and the joy of his salvation. That's just a little bit about the significance. Just let me read again. Look at verse 13. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth, and it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. Let's think about the situation. A cloud over the earth. What would that mean to Noah, his wife, and their sons? Another cloud. Is there going to be another flood? Ah, but the cloud is there. But there's something else there. The bow is there. The rainbow is there. What a picture of the gospel of God's grace. Isn't there something glorious about the rainbow when you look at it? Isn't there something gracious in God that he places the rainbow in the cloud and says, no matter what you are or who you are, I'm never going to bring judgment like that on the earth again. Ah, but as I look at its situation, it just tells me a little bit about that great salvation that there is in Christ. Ah, there is indeed wrath to come. John the Baptist comes on the scene, thundering out, flee from the wrath to come. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But I want to tell you tonight, there's not only wrath to come, There's salvation in Christ. Flee to Christ for refuge. Put your trust in him. Depend not on your own righteousness, because it's just like filthy, stinking rags before God. But come and receive from God his own righteousness the righteousness of God in Christ. What a wonderful position to have. That God, the God of judgment, the God who one day will deal with sinners in wrath, is now dealing with us in his grace. The bow is in the cloud. That which speaks of judgment is held back by the token, the bow, in the cloud. In this day of grace, God is working in grace. What is grace? It's the free, unmerited, undeserved, undeserved favor of God. God will meet you no matter what you've been guilty of, and he'll save you. But remember, the bow is in the cloud. And the cloud speaks of judgment. And one day the day of grace will come to an end. And judgment will come upon a Christ-rejecting world. Flee to Christ for refuge. But not only do I want you to think about its situation, but I want you to think about its splendor. 
Isn't there something splendid about a rainbow? The seven different colors of the spectrum. It's light shining on the raindrops, and we get light divided into seven wonderful colors. Red, orange, yellow, green in the middle there. That lovely, soothing color of our own emerald isle. And then there's the blue and the indigo and the violet. Oh, the glory of God is seen in the cloud. He's not only a God of all grace. He's the God of glory. The God of glory that appeared to Abraham. The God of glory that comes and meets us sinners in the person of his Son with the glorious gospel. What a glorious gospel it is. What splendor it brings. It takes the poor, vile sinner and cleanses him from all sin and raises him up from the dunghill to sit with priests and kings and brings him to glory. Oh, when I look at the splendor of a rainbow, I think of the glorious God and of his glorious Son. Oh, remember this much, the God of this age has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, or the gospel of the glory, it could be translated. Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The splendor of the sun, shining on the raindrops. What blessedness. That's our God. But not only the splendor, let's think about the spa. You know, when, when we look at the, the rainbow or the bow in the cloud, we see its span reaches from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. Indeed, when you go to the book of the Revelation chapter 4 and you read about the throne of God, it's a rainbow-circled throne. And I'm told that if you're up in it, a plane on a rainy day, you can see not just the bow, but a full circle. What we see is just the half of it. And when I think of its span, I think of the gospel of God's grace. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And when I see the rainbow reaching from one end of the earth to the other, and remember I can only see the half of it, it tells me that God is the lover of all mankind. I don't know you tonight, but I want to tell you God loves you. God loves you. And dear, help us tonight in Ulster. We have so many of our young people and they're bound and fettered by Satan. And they're caught up in drugs and drinks and all kinds of things that are destroying their lives. And they don't know tonight that God loves them. God loves them. And he sent his son to die for us all. It matters to God about you tonight. And he'll save you tonight. And he's interested in that, so much so that he stripped heaven of the best that was in it, the darling of his bosom, his only begotten son, and he sent him into this world to die, oh, not for his sins, for he had none, but to die for our sins. What a spot. What grace. What a glorious gospel. The span. 
But let me talk just briefly about the shape of this rainbow. We see it in the form of a bow. But there's no arrow in the bow. No arrow. You remember Joseph? We touched just on Joseph this morning. And when old Jacob came to the end of his life, he talked about Joseph. How the archers had shot at him. And they grieved him and hated him. But the hands of his arm were strengthened by the God of Israel. Joseph is a great type of Christ. Ah, my Satan shot at our Savior. But he triumphed gloriously. And there's no bow, there's no arrow rather in the bow for us. It has landed in the Savior. And through his death, he destroyed him who had the power of death, that is the devil. The word destroyed means he disannulled him, he stripped him of his power. What a glorious gospel. It exceeds the glory of the rainbow. The devil has, is a defeated foe. The arrow has lodged in the Savior. He triumphed gloriously when he rose again from the dead. Satan couldn't hold him. He's alive and alive forevermore to save to the uttermost. All that come unto God by him. Let me just finish with succor. What a succor to know that as God looked on the rainbow, he remembered. He remembered his covenant. Ah, but God looks on something even greater tonight. He looks on that one sacrifice that his son made at the place called Calvary for sinners and for sin. And he is fully satisfied. And for all who will put their trust in him, he says, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. The bow and the cloud, just a little lesson about the Savior, the Lord Jesus, who can save you right this moment. I told you I was only a lad. I was 13 and a half the night I trusted Christ as my Savior. In the old town hall in Cookstown, David Shepherd was a preacher. He was making an appeal. I was just a young lad. Didn't want to be making a show of myself in public. But where I sat, I asked Christ, to come into my life and to save me. And he did just that. And he's been with me all the way through life. Hallelujah. What a saviour. Trust him tonight. Trust him tonight. We were talking this afternoon about salvation. And one of the problems I had as a young boy knowing the Gospels, how could I be saved? People said, oh, believe. But, you know, I just couldn't work that out. And I was trying just to illustrate what faith is. You remember the story of uh, the brazen serpent and the fiery serpents in the wilderness. And all that were bitten by that serpent, they died. And then... Moses was told to make a brazen serpent and to lift it up and 
All that would look, would look and live. Just a look. And could you picture a man bitten by the serpent, he's lying, he can't do anything at all to save himself, he's at the point of death, but he just looks. And that moment he lives. He's delivered. That's what happened to me. I looked on the, to the Savior who died on the tree for my sin. And I took him as my Savior. And soon as my all I ventured on the atoning blood, the Holy Spirit entered. And I was born of God. And by grace I've been saved. And I'm on my way home to glory. And one day I'll see the King in his beauty. And be with him for all eternity. Will you come with me? You never started out. Will you come with us, those of us who are saved? And march on in victory to glory. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts.